called protein purification strategies. So here I'm presenting you the protein production pipeline. Uh, so in this, in this part, you first engineer your microbe. You can engineer yeast to produce a metabolite from a plant, or you can engineer E. coli to produce some protein, maybe protein from milk, and then you will proceed to cultivate. It can be from different levels. It can be from a shake plant to a bioreactor. And then after getting the compound of interest, you need to separate the compound. Sometimes you need to first uh, break the cells and then centrifuge, or you can just centrifuge. And then to get the, the product of interest, then you will go further and do purification in chromatography. And then you will finally get your protein pure or your metabolite also. So in this section, I will talk to you about these three parts. And these three parts in industry, it's called protein, downstream processing or down, downstream process. Um, so I also want to mention that with your target protein or with your target compound, you will potentially get two types of contaminants. Contaminants that they can come from the media, that can be sugars, amino acids, antifoam, or other colors that they can happen from the media. Um, like a chromophores, like some colors. Sometimes I watch uh, colors in the media. So, but then when you do the lysis, when you do the cell lysis to extract the protein of interest, you will also have all this other stuff like cell wall debris, lipids. You will have other proteins that they look like your protein. You have a lot of nucleic acids because you are taking out everything. And these are all the compounds that you need to get rid of. You need to get your target protein nice and clean, and you have to get rid of all this stuff. And sometimes if you don't do it fast, these enzymes can be proteases and they can chop down your protein of interest. So if uh, cell lysis is required to release your target protein, additional contaminants need to be removed quickly to prevent target protein degradation. So as, uh, depending of the system or the chassis that you're using for your production, let's say that if you're choosing, if you're using yeast or mammalian cells, you will have extracellular expression and that's good because everything will come out into the media uh, or your protein of interest, it will come out into the media, so then you just need to remove the cells from the liquid or the media, and then you would have a sample ready for purification. But if you use E. coli, the expression will be intracellular, and sometimes you can have three cases. You can have insoluble protein in the cytoplasm, you can have soluble protein in the cytoplasm, or you can have periplasmic space uh, protein, right? So you will have to do a lot of work before to get uh, the, the, the material to get ready for purification. And this is something you need to take in account before you do your, your planning of what's the best chassis for production. You need to think in the purification as well. So I'm in, going to introduce you uh, to chromatography. So chromatography is the best or like the most used method to, to purify proteins. In this case, uh, we have a mobile phase. The mobile phase is the buffer. And we have a stationary phase with there are all these beads, all these resins here. And uh, how it works is that the separation is based on differences in molecular properties uh, that, uh, that comes from the a protein. It can be size or nature that will lead to the different migrations. So the, pro the, the sample will get separated in the way that when they go down. Uh, and then the, each compound will uh, get separated and then like for example here in time three the protein a will come out and then in time four the protein b 
will come out and here we have a detector. This separation can be just gravity or you can also have, you can also have a, a pump to do it. So here you have the detector, the detector will, um, if you're detecting your protein, it will detect the, the amino acids that absorb, uh, the aromatic amino acids that could absorb UV light, so they will be detected, so you would see that protein A is coming first and protein B is coming second. Uh, and the, the system here, when you have a pump, is that you have the sample that will be pumped uh, that you will be using a pump to put it inside the column and here you need to control the pressure because you cannot have bubbles so when you do chromatography you fight against the bubbles so you don't want to destroy the resin and you don't want to put the back back pressure because of the bubbles so you have to take care of that um, and then you will have the detector at the end of the column so you can detect the products and then you will have fraction collectors so so you will get these fractions separated from these other fractions so now i will talk to you, you i will introduce you the three most uh, well known and most used in the in the in the uh, the methods for purification using chromatography so the first one is called it's based on molecular size. This is why it was, it was important to know how big, how fat is your protein. And it's called size exclusion chromatography. The second one is based on the protein chemistry of your protein. And this is more related to the net charge that your protein has. So if, it, if it's uh, positive or it's negative. So, and, so, and then we have the aff affinity one. So in this case, we are taking into account his tags that they already been engineered inside the construct so you can have little tags. So by affinity, you will purify that. And, uh, and yes, and then in, uh, in the pharma industry, you have like different resins, like this protein A resin is really common to be used in the industry where you can selectively uh, catch antibodies. And these uh, resins, they can come in different forms. You can have robocolumns, these little ones, to use the purification in, in using a robot. So the robot will do the purification. Or you can have packed, packed columns that the companies already packed nicely and they sell you. And you can have different sizes of this. And then you can also have a big bottle of resin where you by yourself pack the column. And when you have like a, a little bit more upscale production, you will use this type of resin. So talking about size exclusion, I would let you, uh, I want to tell you that size exclusion works with beads, like these beads that they are packed into the column and they are made of by a inert spherical porous material. So here you can see the, the, the porous of the material. It's usually it's agarose, but you can, there, there's other material. And that minimizes the absorption of the biomolecules because the, this separation is based in size. Uh, so what this means, like a, here I have three different sizes of molecules. The little ones, they will go inside these pores, so they will take longer time of coming out from the column, but the big ones, they will not fit inside the, the pores, so they will just pass through. And uh, you will have the high molecular weight first, and the second, and the third is the, the third one is the smallest um, molecule and everything comes in one CV. One CV means one column volume. And this uh, separation is like a isocratic illusion uh, using one single buffer. And we add a wash step here uh, after, the, after all the uh, proteins are eluted because we want to remove molecules that they could be retaining the column. 
So the protein molecules do not bind to the chromatography bead, which means that the buffer composition does not directly affect the resolution of this process. So here I have a list of different proteins with di uh, different, different molecular uh, sizes. And here I have like, a, these are like the recommendations that the, the companies that they sell resins, they give you like, you can have different uh, size of beads. So the resin selection is guided by the size of your protein of interest. And then you need to set the column pressure and flow rate using the resins manufacturer guideline. Then the sample concentrations adhere to a range uh, specified for the resin. Like let's say if I have a preparative column, I could load more or less 0.5 to 4% of the column, column volume. And we need, if we want to optimize the method, we just adjust to the column height or flow rate or buffer composition as well. Uh, and the size exclusion chromatography, it can be used for desalting the buffer exchange at high flow rate using broad short columns. In this case, it's like a, you have your protein, but you want to get rid of the salt. So if you see here, I'm measuring conductivity. So you will see the conductivity of the salt and you will see the UV signal from your protein. And you will have like one CV of that. And and in one CV, you would get your protein desalted, and that's that's a nice feature. Okay, so now talking about cation and anion exchange chromatography, uh, we will have a mixture of proteins as well here, like a mixture of protein applied to the column. Then we will have charge-based separation occurs by differential affinities for the exchange resin, as, as I mentioned you. And that uh, that if it's cation exchange, you will have a an, a negative charge, and if you have an anion, you will have a positive charge. Um, resin. So, and then the the way of um, separation will be based in the salt concentration. So, if you have here first low salt concentration, and then the the molecules will get separated, but then you will go up to high salt concentration to 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 fight like it will deattach the the stronger the proteins they will bind the stronger to the to the resin and the high salt elution will help them to get out of the column. So the chromatography shows the separation here, like you see the low salt protein comes first and then the middle and then the, the high salt concentration. So the, in, this, in this chromatography, there is also, there's always these steps. The first of equilibration. So you need to equilibrate your resin with the right buffer. You load the sample, you wash the unbound undesired proteins and then you elude your protein of interest and you always have to re-equilibrate your column and then you storage the column because you reuse, you have to reuse many times. If you are nice and take care of your column, you will reuse your column many, many times. So here I'm showing you two types of resin from BioRat. And it's, it's a resin for like a, for anion exchange is called Nubia Q. So here is the positive, uh, uh, hydro is the positive ligand and the anion ex and, and the cation exchange you will have a negative and these beads these beads are polymers that they are hydrophilic and they are bound to this ligand so these ligands are giving the charge and the average particle size is between 50 to 85 micro micrometer in microns and supports the a pressure of uh, high pressures and can go flow rates like 500 centimeter per hour and resins are stable at different ranges of ph and salt tolerance and this is really really important because 
you need to have this really clear. So let's, your, if you identify your, that the PI of your proteins is at uh, this, this pH, then you need to identify what's the stable, the, the stable range of your protein. Let's say that it's from here to here. So then you need to choose, uh, in this case, uh, anion exchange uh, chromatography because your protein will be, mm, oh, sorry. Your protein will be in this range positively charged. So then you need to choose this, this resin. So that's the trick. You need to find what, what's the net charge of your protein and which is the resin that needs to match. And this is the reason why these beads, they need to support a wide range of pHs because you will play around with different, uh, and they need to be stable at different pHs. And they need to support salt because you will have high salt. And this is why these beads are engineered. And, and these beads, every time they are getting more and more fancy. So they have, you have really, really a big variety of providers with really cool new type of resins. You will, you will always be happy <laughs> to go and buy new type of resins. So the method development for this technique, it begins doing a gradient elution followed by a step elution to find the best condition where the protein binds best to achieve the high yield. So at the beginning, you don't know how your protein will behave. So you need to in, in, run the calibration and then inject the, the sample and then go up in salt concentration gradually and this is called gradient elution so here you will have like a proteins that they will not bind so far so strong so they will come out first and then the proteins that they bound really really strong with the resin they will have they will be eluted at high salt concentrations so, and then after you do this, you will identify that, let's say that this is your protein of interest. And then you will say, ah, so I don't need to go high up in salt. So then you can go just five CVs to get rid of the unbound proteins. And then you will identify that at 10 CVs, your, your, your protein of interest is coming. So then you will choose that by default. Then you will like narrowing down your your range of salt concentration and ideally you should have an idea of how good is how how good is the binding capacity of your protein to the resin and for that you need to have these studies like where you have salt concentration and ph and then you will know exactly that 95 percent of your protein or oh, it's really well bound to the resin at this ph and this salt concentration. So ideally, you should get to know really good your protein and your resin and the interaction between each other to get high yields of protein. So the, now I'll pass to the third uh, method. Now it's called histac purification. And this method uh, begins from the beginning of the, the, the pipeline for production. So here I have my plasmid, here I have my the gene of interest, and then I have the histac here. I have six histidine um, amino acids together, and they could be at the C terminal or they could be at the N terminal because they need to be easily hanging to get an uh, accessible uh, bind to the metal ion. Um, yes, with the minimal effect on the protein folding. So here you will see, this is the his, the his tag, the polyhistidine tag that is uh, binding to the nickel, the, the metal. This technique is also called immobilized metal ion chromatography uh, because you can use different metals to, to do this. Uh, separation and uh, also recently you can use these beads made of uh, it could be magnetic beads so you can just mm, catch your protein like that with a magnetic bead <laughs> so cool 
so it's kind of uh, the same thing it's like uh, equilibration then on the sample application and then you will wash the unbound proteins and other material and then you will elute with um, with imidazole because this time imidazole will compete for the interaction with the histidine and we, it will it will strip all the all the protein out from the com column and then you will come back to do re-equilibration so the problem with this the method uh, is that it's really long because you need to take it out you need to break the cells uh, you need to uh, get all the protein into another tube do centrifugation you need to collect the supernatan because here you're getting rid of e coli or another bacteria then you get the, the media and then you need to filter it out and then you can purify so they calculate this is a long sample preparation so the companies they calculate that it was like from 120 to 160 minutes of doing that but then they had the brilliant idea to develop this type of column where you just break the cells and just run the purification and then you will have 80 minutes <laughs> you will save some minutes of your life in the lab so this i use this column they are good uh, but i just wanted to let you know the new things that what's going on in the market and um, to optimize this method, you could test different metal ions, and uh, it can be copper, nickel, all the other ions. Uh, you can also play around with different concentrations of imidazole, and if and then you can try also different temperatures because sometimes your protein could be time temperature sensitive, so then you need to work in the cold room and um, sometimes you don't need to it could be room temperature uh, so now I, I want to show you a little bit about this chromatography equipment that i like and i think it's really useful uh, all these three methods that i mentioned before they can be run using this equipment this equipment is quite uh, fancy but it's handy and nice because you can control many things and you can run the purification again and again you can put them in loops um, so but i want to tell you a little bit how this equipment works and don't get uh, scared by this uh, graph but i'll tell you that here we have the sample and the sample needs to get inside the equipment so for that reason we have a sample pump that will pump the sample in and then we have the pressure monitor because here we are controlling that the sample doesn't contain bubbles of oxygen and then we will have here another another quaternary valve that will help you to pump your buffers so you have inlet a and b and these buffers they will be here and you will also have a pump and then you will also have a pressure control because the buffers cannot have bu uh, bubbles and then all this sample and the buffers, they will get together and they will go here and then you will have a column and the column uh, will also um, be, have the, the UV monitor after the column. So you can monitor your protein of interest going out. You will have a conductivity monitor because you need to monitor the salt concentration and a pH monitor and finally you will have your pure protein that be that can be collected in a in a bottle or in a fraction collector so the fraction collector is here so i i was thinking that it would be good to for you to know that these equipment exist and that that you can use it so now finishing it up i will tell you the summary and tips for this section it would be that separate the protein of interest from all possible contaminants to avoid protein degradation it's really important obtain your protein specific chemical properties using amino acid sequence choose the right buffer that will keep your target protein stable during the entire purification process choose the best strategy for protein purification and you need to consider these things like use a simple purification method 
the method of optimization, you need to do it to achieve higher protein yields, the protein purification to the level required for your downstream assay, uh, selection of a cost-effective method in case you would like to scale up your purification process, and questions. I don't know if they have questions. So we did have one and you kind of answered it towards the end. It was in the context of the ACTA. Um, the question was when or how do you know the exact pressure that the system's putting on your proteins? Yeah, so the, the colon, the company that sells you the colon will tell you the, the right um, pressure and flow rate because they, they are experts in that and they control everything. So you just need to put in the ACTA the flow rate and the pressure and then the machine will control it for you yes that's the nice part of getting an acta in your lab yes. all right and we just had another question come in does the advanced equipment for chromatography do the three types of chromatography or just one per instrument uh, I mean, you can have uh, you can have three columns in parallel, and if you program the software, you can get them. But it's kind of like a little bit hard to. I never did it, uh, but I think it's possible. But you can also run individually. You can run size exclusion first. And you can change your column and put uh, the cation exchange chromatography and then you can put the Hista column there and then run it. So you can run three, the, the three methods separate. And I think you could run them in tandem as well, but you need to plan, you need to program the software to, to do that. But I think it's possible, yes. Okay. One other question we just had come in. How do we adjust the chromatography conditions if we are searching for a completely new protein which we do not know anything about? Mm. So uh, you need to know at least the protein sequence because if you know the protein sequence you will have an idea of, uh, of uh, uh, the uh, you will know, uh, but you also can do. Ah, uh, yeah, I'll show. I'll answer that question also with the with the with the ne in the next season in the next section because in the next section I'll show. Um, you can do SDS page, and every time you purify, you need to see it in the gel, uh, which is the protein that you want to find. But but then you need to know the the size of the protein. So. To identify an unknown protein, you need to know the sequence of the unknown protein. Because if you don't know, then it's really hard. Then maybe you, at least you will need to know some piece so you can do ELISA and then maybe you can kind of like uh, find the unknown protein. Or you need to identify, like you could do also um, uh, Western blood so you can identify which is the band in your gel that has the potential unknown protein. So you can send it for sequencing. But the key is also getting the sequence of the unknown protein. So you need to get the sequence in some, in some way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, OK, 